Welcome back. I hope you had a lovely uh, lunch break at conferences like this. Obviously, much happens between the official sessions. Uh, so I hope um, you had uh, inspiring conversations. Um, I'm delighted now to uh, introduce um, our next session. That's the second horizontal theme. Uh, it's a um, a session on universities as platforms for learning. We uh, addressed that a little bit this morning already, so uh, I think we laid some of the ground here. And uh, I turn over now to Jean-Claude Cudon from the University of Montreal, who kindly agreed to moderate uh, this session, and he will then introduce um, the wonderful group of panelists up here. So with that, Jean-Claude, please. which is very bad for my ego. <laughs> now my ego is being fulfilled. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me and inviting all of us, I suspect, and, uh, and the opportunity of discussing this uh, particular theme of universities as platforms of learning. When we were preparing for this session, which I confess not having done as diligently as I should have for very personal reasons, which I won't go into. Um, the, um, uh, the one theme did emerge, which was uh, let's move forward with all we can do with the new technologies and the new ideas attached to these technologies. But let's not forget that two things. One is that within these changes in technology, there are uh, power distributions that are being affected within the institutions. And of course, if you change power, you're doing things which are generally called revolutions, essentially. That's what a revolution really is. It's not the introduction of a technology. It's a shift in the power structure. And therefore, one can expect that uh, we have to face up to a number of forms of resistance. And these forms of resistance can themselves take a number of shapes from the macro, massive resistance to change. For example, the departmental structure, the disciplinary structure, which are part of the and parcel of the university as it developed since the 19th century, at least. Uh, but there are also forms of micro resistance where people might even give the impression that they are taking uh, over a number of ideas and tools that are being developed right now only to subvert them and bring everything back to where it was before. Um, the, French, uh, the French philosopher Michel de Certeau used to spend a good deal of time explaining how Indians in Latin America would, on the surface, take on the Catholic religion only to restore covertly uh, the uh, old practices of their former religion, just cloaking them in the new rites, but the content remained what it used to be. So in the preparation of, of, uh, of this, uh, of this uh, session, I, I suggested to my colleagues that not only should they deal with all the wonderful formal things that uh, they all want to, to introduce and with which I'm to, with, to which I'm very favorable, but not forget the resistance elements which actually Marco yesterday introduced a little bit when he, th he talked about authorities and the refusal of authorities. Uh, I think that was part of the, this kind of power struggle that uh, will be going on within the universities. The, the other theme that developed very quickly in our discussions was what is a university? What kind of entity is it? And uh, generally, many, many people within universities tend to think of their university as a kind of autarkic, closed system. A hub, they may say, if they want to, in a kind of paternalistic way, uh, think that they can irrigate a, a, an intellectual climate or a region or an economic scene. But they still see themselves at the center, and if they are, if they are not completely closed up to the world, they control the way they communicate with the world. Well, it may well be that we are moving into a situation where a university will not control those things anymore, will have to deal with other universities, will have to create spaces of 
collaboration in research and education, and perhaps new kinds of educational and research territories are, being, are emerging in front of our own very eyes uh, because of these changes in uh, the modes of doing research, the modes of doing teaching, and the new tools and the network environment into which we are gradually moving. So without further ado, because I don't want to hog the whole, uh, the whole meeting to my advantage, that would not be fair, uh, I just want to put this as a sort of free backdrop to my colleagues, free to them to fit within that or go beyond or react to it or criticize it. This is just as a way to put a, a, modicum, a modicum of focus uh, on this whole session. Now we'll speak in the following order. Uh, there is a slight change from the order that's in the program. Marco De Rossi will start. Uh, Carlo will follow. Delia in third position. Katarina after Delia. And Stefan uh, last but not least. So maybe we can start immediately with Marco if we may do so. Thank you. Oui. Before you start, just a little remark. I, I would encourage you to sort of call upon each other while you speak. So perhaps you can be happy if people interrupt you sometimes to ask you a question. Better, okay. <laughs> and uh, and uh, five minutes per person, more or less. Okay, I presume I can start talking about my project. I don't know. Um, OIL project, uh, which is Open Interactive Lessons Project, uh, uh, started in 2004 and the problem was that I was quite good at building websites but I was no good at all at using Linux and uh, on a forum I found people who had uh, who were good at Linux and not so good at building websites and uh, we said uh, well oh my god what a luck we should definitely exchange our knowledge and uh, so at the beginning uh, everything started as a online school uh, by chat and we had lessons of these two matters and also about um, security uh, computer security and uh, it was quite hard it was in the evening it was on a chat so if you uh, so the, the teacher who who was able to, to type uh, faster was the better teacher and uh, at the beginning all, all the students were uh, teenager as, as we were and I mean there is no so distinction between teachers and students in, in oil project and we've, we've, in 2006 we began to have audio lesson voice lessons uh, live lessons this is the core point for us because we think that having someone who answers to our question immediately is one of the main component to, or one of the most important thing in online e learning have is having this opportunity i mean when you have a lot of people who uh, who see and watch the recordings but asking and being answered is good uh, as i as i was saying we began to have voice lessons and at the end video lesson last year and uh, on the other side, on the content side, uh, um, we, uh, we had an evolution because uh, at the beginning, as I said, everything was about information technology and computers. And now it's quite about innovation economy. And uh, the difference is that we don't have just uh, teenagers who, who teach. Uh, and now we have experts, journalists, politicians, and things like that. Uh, who, who decide to, to share just what, what they know and to sacrifice to, to share their evening, just two hours, I mean, just to tell anyone who, who wants to be connected with about their work, uh, what they think about the economic crisis, what they think about uh, uh, public health, etc. And uh, we, have, we have people who, who follow us and uh, they make question now on oil projects you can rank a question which is quite quite good because you have students who who wa really want to, to 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 propose a good question and there is competition on these aspects and uh, this allow to 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 see and uh, it, it's 
I mean, it's not like being in a physical place together, but you, you, you can really meet and become friends with your virtual uh, schoolmate. And all these, these sensations and perceivings, we call them peer-to-peer -peer feeling, uh, which is uh, summarizing the fact that you can become teacher. You, you have just to, to send an email to, to the old project staff and then we just check that you know what uh, you'd like to, to teach. I mean, uh, you can become teacher, everyone can become teacher, and uh, you, you feel like the teacher you are listening to because you are also a teacher. We, can, we call all this peer-to-peer -peer feeling, and uh, um, together with the fact that Oil Project is uh, totally independent, uh, we, we think it's one of uh, the keys of the success of the project itself, which has 10,000 students, uh, and uh, about the same number of uh, uh, live recording views a month. Uh, and the, during the classroom, uh, during the live lesson, we are about, it depends, uh, uh, 20, 40, one, 100, 200, it depends on how much the topic is uh, hot uh, and cult uh, and pop. Uh, uh, don't and uh, we can talk again later about the project if you have questions and now I'd like to to give the microphone to uh, to, Mar to uh, Carlo I have one quick question before I make my point I was interested in uh, well learning and assessing your learning so is there a way people who use and benefit from the opportunities that you offer can assess how much they learned. Do they feel that need? Uh, are you talking about the access to, to teach or to learn? To learn. No, to learn. Uh, Learning, yes. All our, our contents are available, available. You can do what you want. They are, they are under Creative Commons. And... Uh, no, not access, as assess. Assess. Measure, to measure, to evaluate. Ah, to, exactly. to measure the measure quality, the, the quality aspects. Yes, okay. S say yes. that I go and I want to learn but, topics. Um, we are in a, not an oil project, but to, to globally, we are on early stages about e-learning. The, the first version of e-learning, we began to talk about e-learning. You began because I was too young in a decade ago and the e-learning 1.0 was a failure, I mean. Uh, and then everything is different uh, and uh, there, is, there, there is no way to, to measure the quality of contents. Uh, the thing I'm sure about uh, is that uh, if all project uh, had been controlled by someone uh, on a contents and quality point of view, it would have been everything completely different. Maybe uh, people uh, wouldn't be available for teaching for free because everything is... Uh, is is run by volunteers. And uh, we heard about information wants to be free, but the core thing is that uh, information producers wants to be free, that's the meaning. And uh, being independent is, is, is quite relevant. Indeed, when I heard about, uh, uh, last day we talked uh, about uh, World University be the center of with, uh, or companies, I don't know, maybe we have to find uh, uh, a third element who put every, everyone together. Of course, university will be uh, for the content aspects uh, uh, relevant, but that's not all, I mean. Right, thank you, that, that's pretty interesting. It's connected to my thinking, and I, I think a very good way of assessing the quality of your teaching is just by counting the number of people who are interested in learning from you, freely interested. I mean, nobody's forced to go there and learn about something. So if people keep going, that means that you're doing a pretty good job. Yes, that's the topic of wisdom of crowds. But I don't know because the, the lesson with uh, the highest number of users was the one about uh, uh, Spinoza.it, which is a satirical blog, uh, a, comic bl uh, a blog with comics and funny things. Uh, and I don't know at a quality level how it was. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, I would like to reflect briefly on the word platform. I like that metaphor to talk about learning and, and universities. If I think about platforms intuitively, I think about something which is useful, useful to sustain us. Uh, 
to give stability to us or even to get us closer to something. You, know, you, have, you can have an elevator, which is a platform, and it allows you to reach something which would be otherwise unattainable. Maybe you still have to do the job, but you need some help to get there. And I was thinking about, are they really platforms at the moment? And then I ended up thinking about a context, our context, in which we need to learn and, and use what we learn. And um, it's a context which is pretty complex. There is uncertainty, we don't have information, or we have too much information, and we don't know about the reliability of that information. How do we choose? Yesterday someone said, why is number one in Google better than number two? And why shouldn't I check page 45 and expect to find something more relevant to me? So it's, it's a pretty complex uh, system. And then I said, well, I said to myself, in this context, are universities really platforms for learning? Are they succeeding in being? I'm not talking about the intention, but the actual outcomes. And I thought about all the learning that happens outside of universities in educational but non-traditional learning contexts or even non-educational contexts. I spoke earlier on about games, but even social networking is a tremendous space in which learning occurs. And I, I thought about how many of these contexts um, afford the opportunity of experiencing things which you cannot experience in ordinary context. And then I thought about the importance of experience to deal with complexity. So back I went to wondering whether universities can really be considered platforms. And then I asked myself, what about experience in universities? Well, based on my university experience, I thought about laboratories. That's one of the first things you know, that you think, or at least me. And then laboratories, that word brought along chemistry and physics and computer science. And I said, and what about economics? What about social relationships? What about psychology? Uh, what about communication? What about experiencing and putting knowledge in practice in those contexts? Can we do that in universities nowadays? Because we can do that in other contexts. So how come we think about platforms which maybe we cannot get at close enough to those kind of experiences? And could we think about how to turn universities into proper platforms, even in those fields, bringing the experience into the university, eventually broadening the university beyond you know, the physical space. Should we think about that? Could that mean that you know, maybe universities would be a better platform given nowadays complexities that is there? It's there, that's a fact. That's a fact. So I would like to just lay on the table these points to feed our discussion in a minute. Any reaction, question? I was about to ask, uh, in a sense, when you look at the campus life on North American universities, which tend to try and behave like, uh, I would say, kind of a utopian society, slightly shielded from the rest of the world, but in which most of the normal dimensions of life go on, could that be considered as a wider form of experience that would make that university look closer to the kind of platform you're looking to? It could. And it could. And it actually brings me back to a conversation that I had this morning about learning environments in general. That's definitely a, a potentially very good learning environment. But I think that one condition in order for that work of platforming, so to speak, to be relevant is that you provide not only the means of getting closer to knowledge, but also the means of reflecting mm -hmm. about what you're learning. It's not just because I put you in the context of a military simulation or a 
social simulation or something like that, that you will learn and then do something or transform yourself. That's another thing that I, I like very much. The idea of having the uh, students saying, what can this text do with me? How can I transform and be better based on what I learn? If you don't have the means of reflecting, then you know, the relevance of the learning environment it's still there, but maybe it's not the best that we could hope for. So in those campuses, are those means there? Can people be aware of what is happening? If yes, well, they're pretty good. <laughs> Thank you. OK, any more? Yes? No? You want to? I get only one in the <laughs> So Delia, now. Uh, thank you, and you can all hear me. Fantastic. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, another um, open education online project called Peer to Peer University, which, like the OIL project, is in very early stages. Um, uh, we only started uh, piloting the Peer to Peer University as a concept back in September uh, last year, running seven uh, six week university level uh, type courses using uh, Peer to Peer as a platform. And we've just uh, run our first, first official cycle from March this year of about 15 courses and plan a second cycle of six-week courses that start in September, probably for another 20, 25 courses. So we tend to be doubling each session or each cycle of the number of courses. So what Peer-to-Peer -peer is, is a, an online community of um, open study groups for short-level six-week university courses of sorts. So it's like an online uh, book club for open educational resources. And so what we try and do with our platform is try and help you navigate the whole sort of vast wealth of open educational resources that are available. We create uh, small groups of motivated learners um, and we help support the design and facilitation of these courses using sort of open um, source um, software and technology. We, our, our students and tutors, if I can call them that, they're more like leaders, uh, we, we rec they get recognition through certificates from peer to peer for their participation or completion of courses. And at the same time, even though it's very early days, we are trying to build pathways to formal credit as well for those courses. For instance, in the first pilot we did, uh, one of the students actually got recognition for his participation in the Copyright for Educators course towards his PhD in a university in America. So even in early days, there seems to be some formal credit um, starting to happen. Um, and one of the things I just want to sort of talk about uh, Obviously, that all the material is open that we create. We're trying to create more open education resources. Uh, where possible, we try and make um, only teach with open education resources. But if we can't, then we link to available material on the in internet, even though the terms and conditions might be all right reserved. I suppose how we're different from the traditional online university um, is that we are really basing our sort of learning around student-based learning rather than taught then teacher-led, so the course leaders are there to lead students through project-based scenarios or real case scenarios. Uh, there's no one way that a course can be run. We're experimenting in many different ways of how students can learn, but it's pretty much based on student groups working together and uh, learning with each other and assessing and, and reviewing each other as well. The leaders are really there to assist where you go wrong as opposed to telling you how to actually learn something. So it's quite experimental in that way. I think the other thing to remember from the university point of view at this conference is it's just not enough to make material free online. It's just not enough to put a static course up there online in the hope that people in their, in their homes will actually sit there and engage that course. You need something that is dynamic and that brings community of learners together. Um, and so you've got to be able to sort of like uh, experiment with using the social network technologies to see if it's possible to bring students together. And I think even in the early days of the peer-to-peer -peer university, we've seen that it does seem to be possible to create communities of learners from across the world, from Africa to Canada to the UK to India to, to Brazil, that you have a bunch of students from very different places who are working together using asynchronous communication or synchronous communication or using that platform and doing work together. And I think that's very exciting because it brings different cultural perspectives that you don't normally get exposed to. The other thing too is a lot of these students, particularly from the south, from countries 
uh, where they're not going to get an opportunity to get into Harvard, uh, for whatever reason, distance, you know, uh, money, etc. This also is a great opportunity of bringing sort of more sort of social, uh, you know, bringing people together in, in, for a social justice purpose as well. Uh, also, we have the ability that people volunteer their time to be course leaders. For instance, in the course that I run, which is copyright for educators, you know, I have an Australian academic, I have two researchers from Cape Town University, I have a Creative Commons legal counsel, and uh, I have a researcher by the London School of Economics, all of them volunteering their time over six weeks to help lead groups of teachers through case scenarios to do with copyright of educators. And I can't think of any fee-paying university where you would have that sort of like volunteer resource that the students can call on and actually participate with uh, using, using sort of the technology we've got available now. You talked about before about the assessment, how do people assess themselves through learning. There's many ways that we are experimenting with this. For instance, you know, we get enormous feedback from the students during the courses. You know, they'll complain about the technology or they'll actually comment about how much they've enjoyed and how much they've learnt from each other in, in, in going through these courses. Uh, we off, they can often will self-evaluate what they know now at the end of the course from what they had in the beginning of the course. So it's a really different way of, of getting feedback from the students about what they feel they've got out of the courses. So some of the courses we evaluate, pass or fail, some have no evaluation. It's just having the experience of, of, going, of working together um, in a particular uh, community. I think we're a bit different from, we're helping challenge universities in this space. Um, you know, the university structure that I, I'm used to, and I'm not saying this is all university, was very much that push out lecturing method, which doesn't always suit all types of learning. Um, suits some and not others. And so I think some people want to learn in less traditional ways, and this shows we're able to experiment in this place because it's, it's, a, it's a community, volunteer-based, um, project that we're doing, so we're able to sort of see what works. We're also able to react very quickly to things that don't work, to see what we can do to improve them. So I think it's a very organic and experimental place that, that helps uh, test particular um, ways of learning with universities. So we actually see ourselves as not replacing universities, but perhaps working in partnership, collaboration with universities about looking at new ways of, of, of learning. And I'm using the word learning rather than teaching, because I think it's, it's a very different uh, paradigm. Um, I also think uh, the other important thing about peer-to-peer -peer is that it's an open project. So even if you're not uh, in a particular course, you can log on and you can actually lurk, I suppose, in a course and watch and see what's going on in real time. Even when the course is finished, all the material is still up there for you to view and assess, including the students' participation. Everything's licensed under a Creative Commons by share alike license. So, and, and basically, you know, we are driven by not just comments from our students participating, but also by people who are participating by, you know, uh, a more passive way, also getting quite excited and wanting to also join or create uh, new things. The other good thing about this is we're building a community, so people who do courses then are inspired perhaps to take that course, lead it for the next cycle of iteration. So we're trying to build all the time participation and, and the extent of courses. Okay, thank you very much. Before going on, I'm, I'm starting to get some trends developing through the three of you that have already spoken. One of them, for example, coming from both uh, Marco and you, Delia, is the presentation of, of experiments that are on the margins of, the, of, the, of existing institution, institutions, schools, universities. And Delia, in particular, you have, you have uh, alluded to the possibility of collaboration with universities and so on. I, I'm not sure you have addressed that issue very, very much in the OIL project, but I was, I was in effect raising to myself the following question. Do you think you have with your, your experiments um, the possibility of helping to effect some change within the traditional institutions, universities, or schools. In your case, you're starting from inside, and you're saying there's something really greatly lacking in, the, uh, in this institution. There is not enough attention paid to what you call experience, and it should be somehow integrated in the content dissemination and other practices of the university. So before we go back to you, I'd like to hear both of you how, how you, you want to change things, in effect. 
We have already got relationships with the universities. We are being incubated by the University of California, Irvine. Mm -hmm. We also, uh, which Katharina will talk a bit more, we're actually running, uh, participating with the, a course that's been run by Joe Ito through K University called Digital, Digital Journalism, which is quite an exciting experiment where we have peer-to-peer -peer students uh, interacting with the physical students at K University. And they're not getting an accreditation for this, they're just doing this for the love of learning and collaboration. And I think uh, we have other conversations now happening, I think early conversations with UNISA, University of South Africa, that's very interested in our platform because you know, they are, uh, have around 300,000 students, UNISA, and they're looking at alternative ways of delivering education because that are maybe uh, more effective but also cost effective for them too. So, we're very keen on sort of working with all sorts of institutions mm. and also business and industry. So we're working with Mozilla to develop the School of Webcraft, online uh, courses, practical project-based courses, teaching people from novices to like the, um, I suppose, the web elite on open web standards and, mm. and uh, development. So there's all sorts of opportunities. Right, right. So you see yourself already beginning to effect change through these collaborations and, and experiments, right? Yeah. How about you? Oil projects. Uh, oil project is not run in the U.S. It's run in Italy. So we are incubated just by my lighting room, University of my lighting room, and uh, I agree with her when she says that we are just trying to define alternative way of learning. And this is strictly connected to uh, what he said, which is what's the right platform, which platform. Um, we could think about that. We could define a platform A, a platform B, C, D. And the answer to which is the right platform is, of course, that we don't know it. But I used to, I get angry because all the platforms we are talking about, uh, from the, from our resourceful point of view, um, cost nothing or <laughs> or nearly nothing. We are talking about not so much money and resources and people. And uh, I'm I mean we should do them all, A, B, C, D. Who cares? We we are talking about a few millions of dollars for A, B, C, D. And afterwards, we, we should uh, understand and realize from our ex experiment which are the right, uh, the right formats, the right ways, uh, etc. And uh, nobody, at least in Italy, does that. And it's incredible, I mean. Uh, the aim of everything is not just, just I mean, uh, we, winning uh, a glass of water. The winning, the aim, the goal of that is having a completely new, new way to understand, to uh, deal with knowledges and uh, and way of learn for every not not just students. I mean, uh, with this with these uh, tools, you can learn it also if you are working. Uh, you can do by yes. We should, but why should? Why is it not happening? That's the right question. <laughs> but <laughs> we should ask them to. I should ask it to resistance. Uh, yes, <laughs> and it's also uh, an age matter, of course, but. I, I can't understand that, mm -hmm. just for a, for a money point of view, I mean. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because there is no a, another project in Italy better than oil project, because oil project uh, which, which uh, better receive money, I mean. It's not that uh, you, Marco De Rose, but who are you? <laughs> I, get, I prefer to give money to, to someone else. It's not that top. But, and I don't know in the States, indeed, I, I, I'm, yes, I'm curious about that. We're not based in the States. We're not based anywhere. I'm in Sydney, Australia. Someone else is in South Africa. Someone else is in Brazil. Someone else is in Boston. We're, so we're, when I say we've been incubated by University of California, they're helping us administer any funding we get towards particular projects. But we're completely mm -hmm. kind of all around the world. Uh, we, uh, the, the council, the founders are five people from very different parts of the world and very different disciplines. We meet and discuss things um, on Skype at Always a ridiculous time in the morning for me in Australia. Like very horrible time, like five in the morning or something. But but we're not a we're not a so we are still a grassroots kind of way that we're doing it. But we're not we're not a US based institution. We're just trying to we're working around the world. But we just happen to have a a kind university helping us to administer our funds. 
But we are aliens. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Let's, let's move on, but you, do you want to broach quickly the issue of how to change from the inside? But in passing the microphone, let me remind everybody that maybe the, the, the greatest invention to have is really how to effect change. It's not just having great ideas and great technology. It's use that for te techniques of changing things. And this is the real difficulty to my mind. It's how you make things change. What I'm trying to do, and th this is quite interesting, because at, at the University of Worcester, I'm redesigning a whole degree. The, uh, actually, it's the games design and development degree. And first and foremost, you said when you introduced Delia, your project, you mentioned this issue of motivated students. And sometimes you have to deal with no motivated students. So I'm focusing. At the moment, we are focusing at the University of Worcester with the process and the tools, on the process and the tools. We are trying to envision different teaching learning dynamics. And actually, I'm working to shape some of them up as if they were a game. I'm not talking about competition necessarily. I'm talking about challenges, achievement, and open spaces to compare results copy each other's, not because of the mark, but because I did something cooler than what you did. And then, so there is a process, which is human being based, and then there is the issue of tools. So a significant amount of work has to be put into uh, modifying existing tools, providing frameworks. I could mention, for instance, that we're working on the creation of a an aquarium, a piece of software which simulates an aquarium in order to teach programming to students because they can learn, first of all, system thinking through an aquarium rather than focusing on the syntax of a code, which will be obsolete in five years. Yeah. And then they can see what happens, so the experience, writing lines of code and seeing fish doing this or that. And then they could be challenged because they have to do, they have to make fish doing this or that. And then there could be variety, because I could do it one way, and you could do it in another, better, cooler way. So you have this achievement, reward, and kind of playful dynamics. This is how, in some contexts, we're trying to change things. But to address the issue of why isn't that happening on a broader scale, there is the issue of cost, mm -hmm. there is the issue of resources, there's also the issue of power. I'm afraid we should not neglect it. I'm a bit cynical when it comes to you know, facing reality. Yes, we all work for the good of knowledge, but knowledge means power. And shh, don't, say, don't say that aloud. <laughs> and, and, and change means you know, rediscussing ourselves, our frames of reference, yielding some power, hopefully to gain some new power, different one. It's a process. It costs and has associate risks. So, okay, very good. We'll pass on now the next segment to Katarina. Thank you very much. I'd like to get back to the point about how we could actually make some change by working with the platforms like peer-to-peer -peer university, and maybe also showcase that not every university is resistant against any kind of change. Um, as Delia has mentioned, at KU University, Joey Ito is teaching a class, um, Digital Journalism. And that's, I think, for peer-to-peer -peer university, the first time to actually combine a real class at KU where students to sign up and get credits together with the virtual class. And I had the pleasure to participate in this class, in the physical class, because I'm located in Tokyo. And it's very interesting to see how much the virtual students appreciate the chance to participate in the class. And part of that, of course, what we can all imagine, that's because the class is by Joe Ito and he gets like famous speakers involved and it's like a circle of friends. So that's, but maybe only half of the truth. I also think there are a lot of students who are really interested in being heard and being part of the discussion. So we have actually a chat room where students can ask questions, they will get answers, they can actually really, the questions will be repeated in class and discussed. So it's really some kind of interactive 
classroom outside the just physical space. And I think that makes it really interesting. So what they, in addition, have to do is to work on projects. So they are encouraged to uh, collaborate on projects with students outside the physical classroom, um, which, of course, gives an international dimension. And um, it, it kind of just opens up what you could do in just the physical classroom. And I think, for me, that's a very interesting example of how um, the platforms can actually be integrated somehow in the already existing university structure. So I think that the new technologies should just be more actively integrated in what we are already doing, which is great. I mean, no one is really questioning that we will replace universities. We will just reshape the structure a little bit. And there are two things that I, I'd like to bring on the table or, or to mention when we think about how to reshape then and maybe not really replace. The first very important point I learned personally is mentorship. I don't think we can ever replace the relationship between a student and the professor. That doesn't necessarily mean that these two have to be in the same room all the time, but there needs to be a connection between students and someone that you see as your mentor. Maybe not, not only between students and professors, also faculty members. I feel the same. I'm a young faculty member and I just feel very happy and privileged to work with someone who has so much more knowledge in a totally different discipline. So that's one important aspect. And the other one, um, I think, is moderation. So we, we heard with these peer-to-peer -peer, um, platforms that we actually need some effort to moderate um, the comments, the questions, the contributions. And I think this morning or yesterday, I, I got the message that some faculty members or some teachers, professors feel kind of overrated to have so much to do in addition now with the digital. So they feel that they have to moderate all the wikis and they have to be present. And what I can see from the KO class, very interesting, actually your co-founder, Philip, is doing a lot of this moderation in a very, very a uh, high quality way in a very smart and a very productive way he's making suggestions of guest speakers so i can see how platforms can you know kind of bring a service to the faculty members so basically i would encourage um, universities or faculties or programs to actually try to experiment a bit and figure out what these platforms can do to to open up a bit mm. this you. this brings up uh, another I would say access of questioning, are these technologies going to help us tweak the university and make it more efficient, better and easier and, and so on, which we all do to some extent. Uh, my own use in my own classes of email with my own students means that I can mentor uh, each one of them individually on their projects by just keeping in touch this way as long as it works and meeting them face to face if we need to go to that level. Uh, is that what we want to do with the new technologies? Or is it what you, yeah, both of you, Marco and Delia, are really proposing things which are far more radical there. I think we should keep also that uh, option open for further discussion later on, because I think the, the consequences are, are very, very, very big. Yeah, if we go to tweaking the university and making it better, it's a reasonably kind of engineering job. But if we go for the you know, the whole shebang, so to speak, of, the, of what you could change in terms of even role, status, personal uh, relationships, authorities, uh, assessment, uh, and all this uh, uh, greater experience, we go into an entirely different world there. You know? So it's, it's, I'd, I'd like to keep this in the background until uh, we hear from our last contributor, I said last but not least, who is going to address that from, I think, a dual academic and OECD sort of perspective, which might be uh, at least personal <laughs> perspective, but yeah. fed by those, this dual experience. Well, yeah, thank you. Maybe what I'm going to do is to look at it from a more system level uh, perspective, so which wouldn't be individual projects, but what we know, well, you know, at the OECD area, so in, let's say, rich countries, and, and put myself more at the system level. So in fact, I'm old enough to have already participated in the first wave of uh, e-learning. And we already had these discussions about how radical, in fact, we even thought at that time that 
online universities would displace, eradicate uh, the campus-based universities? Well, I'm not sure that we still believe that it will really happen, maybe. So what I would like to do is to, to make a few remarks around three questions. The first is, um, what has it changed already, basically? And, and what are the things that for sure we're going to see in the coming future? I would say that the first thing is um, better student experience. I will focus more on, on campus-based universities and how, um, you know, online or e-learning. The, the virtual universities are a different animal, in fact, and we can discuss it too. The first thing is, uh, you know, a lot of flexibility for students in the way they can access um, their classes. So if you take uh, Australia, you have podcasts of the courses. It's, you have really this uh, generalized philosophy that allows students to come or not come to their universities to catch up when they can not make it to... And in all the big countries, Canada too, you have this philosophy. You have all these university you know, learning management systems so that it's much easier to access your syllabus, uh, course material, to do a lot of things. So you have, a, I would say, a real student enhancement for the on-campus uh, student. It's, you know, the e-library, it's so much more convenient. For academics, it has made a tremendous change, especially in terms of speed of access to um, academic resources, you know, these huge databases that they can use. Um, so here again, a very big change. On the administration level too, you know, you have the admissions, which are done differently, I guess, you know, the space management, the financial management, etc. And one of the implications of all that is, um, I would say, the rise of international connections uh, in, in many cases. So, you know, you, we've never seen, there is really a, rocketing of international collaboration in research. We have this growth in cross-border higher education. Um, and all this is facilitated, obviously, by all these new technologies. We have the creation of the multi-campus university, which in many cases was not really feasible when it, you know, there was no possibility of instant um, communication. Or you had to you know, do it one year by one year so that people would know whether you have your credits and uh, etc. No, you have all these new forms that, that have um, emerged. And probably even so, you cannot find them in all countries um, within 10 years, 15 years, that will be something that we will see everywhere on um, campus-based universities. Well, what has not really changed is the teaching. Uh, and learning. Well, to some extent it has, but not at scale. Another thing that people hoped and that did not really materialize is uh, the efficiency and, and the cost-cutting part. And that's a big question, especially now, I would say. that um, In many cases, technology has been, because it has been an add-on in, in uh, institutions, it has also incurred new costs and, you know, and, and all the potential for Cost-cutting has not really materialized, and, and you know, I sit sometimes in um, policy-making arenas, and people are very disenchanted about that aspect with technology, especially as the learning outcomes where they were measured have not increased as much as you would have expected. So what is the second thing is, second question is, what is still to be invented at scale, and so what is the potential that has not been met yet? So the first thing I would say is a new use of face-to-face -face time, which become, you know, that's the most luxurious time in many ways. And probably with all this enhanced um, um, or blended learning or, you know, these web-supplemented learning, etc., it's not clear that people have already found how they should use the face-to-face -face time. And I think it's still a challenge for, for the years to come. The second thing is the creation of or the integration of new learning objects or resources into the experience. So we can see a lot of interesting things happening, you know, and in fact, <laughs> you have um, good examples of, of that. We can think about simulations in medical studies, for example, how people use serious games for that, how people use um, life-size models to experiment how to take a patient uh, in charge, etc. 
of course, we so we have a lot of interesting examples. We have the design of new learning resources, like the Open Learning Initiative, for example. So you have very interesting types of resources, but you have so few of them. Um, you know, you, I don't know. Maybe we are at 20 at most right now, and you know, you had already 12 um, seven years ago. So it's not very fast in terms of development. And possibly there is one more thing which is very important and that's going to change uh, the way potentially the systems operate is something that is not related to learning at all, but it's the creation of new longitudinal data systems and so the use of technology to collect data and make a much more powerful use of them so that in fact you understand why students succeed or don't succeed, what happens to them once, you know, after they go, you know, after they've left their, their university, how do they transfer? Because in many countries, so the U.S. is one of them, for example, you have such um, low graduation rates in some institutions that you want to understand why this is happening and, and how you can improve the efficiency of the system. So my final point is just to react on, on this distribution of power that we were discussing. And I would just like to say that it's a very ambivalent effect. On, you know, on one hand, of course, you have um, the possibility of sharing, the rise of the open educational resources, um, the possibility of accessing expensive instruments remotely, for example, that could really narrow the gap between the rich places and the other ones. It can really allow to access very quickly uh, to the new knowledge. So, you know, some, uh, an African university would be able to know very quickly what has been done by Harvard or whoever. But it does not imply that there will not be a strong stratification between universities. And you can see it with university networks already, where, you know, universities want to, net, you know, to be associated with other institutions that they believe are similar or have the same level of prestige and reputation as, as they have. So that this hierarchy um, will probably still be there. The other thing is that probably the power of a university or an institution lies in the degree granting power. So that if I were a university president, which I'm not, or if I were working in a university, but which I don't either, I wouldn't feel threatened by your project at all because as long as we don't give any degrees to anyone, you know, people have always learned a lot from many other resources than universities, you know. But I wouldn't care. It's not really the knowledge production that makes a university um, a place of power. It's uh, the fact that they can certify and accredit um, this knowledge. So, and if we put that in a, you know, a broad environment that very much depends on political conditions and Another example, so we can see with uh, September 11th how things have changed. So in the US, for example, you have a rise of military research, and by definition, that's something that we don't see, so that it's not shared. Even so, we have in parallel the development of open educational resources. Um, and with all the rhetoric around the knowledge economy, we, you know, increasingly as knowledge will be seen as a source of competition and of wealth, it's difficult to know how things are going uh, to evolve. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any comments on the last two presentations from the panel? No? Well, we have about 20 minutes left, and I think we've raised a number of, I think, important issues. Do we want to revolutionize the university? Do we want to tweak it? Do we want, uh, are we going to uh, use, look at it purely in instrumental uh, uh, forms or are we going to really bring more political issues of power? Are we going to um, develop a wider context for the universities or are we going to try and simply do what we do better with better resources and better tools and uh, uh, perhaps refined forms of, of pedagogy. These are some of the issues that have been, I think, uh, brought up today. And it would be really, really good if now uh, you, you, the audience, could start reacting to this and asking questions, but also reacting and giving your own statements and comments about this situation. The floor is yours. 
Yeah, could you bring the lights up? Thank you. And we need a brave one to start. Yes. This will be in the uh, comment on the refining of the existing kinds of pedagogy. Um, I uh, recently read a book by Clay Christensen called Disrupting Class. Oh, so my comment I think falls into the refining the existing kinds of pedagogy uh, stream. Um, I, I said I recently read a book by Clay Christensen, he's a Harvard Business School professor, who um, pictured a vision of learning based both on the experience of his uh, children and the findings or developments in the uh, developmental psychology, especially the Howard Gardner's theory of multiple kinds of intelligence. And in his vision, he imagines and gives examples of opportunities for both technology companies and educational institutions to use um, the opportunity of change to create learning styles and approaches or environments that will be tailored to different kinds of intelligence. And I think that uh, I, and I, that's way beyond my can to give you uh, more in-depth information about it, but um, I think that um, even in the popular sort of science arena, everybody heard of the um, theory. So if, for example, if a child is more suited to learn mathematics by playing games, then can we provide an environment in which the child can do it? If somebody is musically talented, can we find, with all the knowledge we have at our disposal, learn to enable this child to reach its full potential mm -hmm. in an educational setting? And the mm -hmm. examples go on and on. And there are companies that are beginning to assist educations in developing um, intelligent online tutors. And again, this is all very new, but I thought that it's worth bringing up. So you're suggesting essentially to, uh, you're suggesting an evolution in which the teaching process itself it's could tight. become far more sensitive to the varieties of uh, human beings and their forms of intelligence and could then develop through technology but also through other means, exactly. uh, including the simple skills of people knowing how to teach differently. Uh, you could then develop a more varied a relationship with your students and, and thereby be more efficient. I take this to be a comment, of course, not a question. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, it is. A and he, oh, he you, thinks you... that this will be the most well, disruptive force in education. Right. I, I just have a very spontaneous reaction. I absolutely agree with you, but I would pose the question to you, isn't that already happening? I mean, it's in a very early stage, but I can just generally see that the teaching approach today is just so much more interactive. Students would question the teacher, they would come up with their own crazy ideas and they would discuss it, which 50 years ago or even when I went to law school was not that common. And in this kind of interactive environment with the new technologies, I can also see that even in one discipline, if someone is good at writing something, he could be credited by, you know, writing something good. If someone is good by, in any other kind of media, he could use another medium to, you know, express himself. So I think we are on the way already. But generally speaking, I agree with you, so we would need more flexibility. But I, I don't think it's necessarily something bad right now. I think it's something that we can very well start with. Thank you. Just briefly comment, I do agree as well, of course. I just wanted to pinpoint one interesting thing. At the moment, we're talking about learning, teaching, relationship, uh, learning styles, intelligence styles, and so on and so forth. We have to take into account that there are new disciplines which we still don't know how to teach to start with. And, and for instance, uh, whatever is related with 
game design and development is, is definitely in that area. We're talking about transdisciplinary, teaching, learning, there are no models, it's all new, and even more than that, because they are new, those who deal with it within the academia are not always expert. So that can really, yes, in very many cases, you see that at an early stage. In other cases, it's, let's say, a little bit more chaotic, <laughs> to be gentle. And this brings up the whole issue, of course, of, I alluded to that at the very beginning, the whole issue of our disciplinary structure in universities. That has been designed really originally for teaching purposes. When research was tagged on to, uh, tacked on the, the university, uh, the, the disciplinary structure already was becoming a little bit uneasy. By now, research is radically transdisciplinary in almost every field. And what we're having as a problem is to integrate this perception, this, this perspective, into lower levels of university, not only in the very high uh, graduate levels. Uh, can technology help us do that? Is technology the right avenue to, to reach that kind of problem? <laughs> Please do not speak all together. We might not hear. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I guess technology are, is a solution, is not creating solutions, is the answer for solutions. So technologies could be like tools to, to, to find what new ways, but they are not answers, they are merely instruments, just instruments. Thank you. Well, to the extent that technologies, which I, I would tend to agree with you, are instruments, they nevertheless allow the creation of new social relationships. Uh, we've alluded to that, I think, all around this, this uh, round table this afternoon. Uh, and, and thereby might be the, the key. What kind of social relationships we, would we want to establish within universities in order to achieve a number of variegated roles, including, for example, the one you were presenting, dealing with a variety of forms of intelligence, but also new fields. Uh, how do you deal with new fields that emerge? How do you integrate the transmission of what's already known in these inchoate fields into uh, the, the training of other people? How do you want to involve the students in the development of educational resources, textbooks, for example, uh, is something that is being developed right now through new social relationships. But if I say so, if I say that, I'm coming very dangerously close to the revolutionary view again. Am I not? Sometimes revolutions make sense. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, th there is one thing about technology, which is should we ask ourselves about the degree of comprehension of technology that we have? Because I found very many surprises. I found lots and lots of people talking about this technology and that technology. I'm still talking about within the academia, where you're not that driven by concrete purposes. So it's, it's harder to tell whether you're on the right track or not. Sometimes it shouldn't be. You know, it's against the scientific spirit. But things can be pretty subjective. So uh, to my surprise, especially again in my field, where there is very little written, there is no real common wisdom from which you, know, you can take things and say, OK, this is it. There are lots and lots of uh, subjective interpretation. And more often than not, I wondered, picking up on something that you said earlier on, I wondered whether it would be good to have structural contacts, regular contacts, between academics and other people who deal with education in these fields for other purposes, say training, say just divulgation, and so on and so forth, but who have a closer contact with the customers, with those who are really stakeholders in the learning field, with those who are interested. I could go there and say, what do people want on your website? 
when they, you know, when they want to learn about web development, what are the topics which are really more important to them? Rather than sitting down and saying, I have book A, B, C, hey, let's do PHP. And then someone else will say, that's fine. That's, I heard that word. It seems to be very popular. Fine, let's do that. And then you see students who, and I've seen this, who attend at the lesson and then go like, oh, they said this is web design. But it's not really web design. Never mind. We still have to get the grade or the mark. So maybe a closer contact between different realities could lead to focus better on what to do, especially with new things. Well, that's exactly what <laughs> Peter Peer is doing with the School of Webcraft um, idea, which is, first of all, we had the course Mashing Up the Web. Now we're about to launch two or three more courses in September on um, you know, learning about HTML5 code, building social design. And I think just yesterday there was a call for interest from people about what sort of... Uh, they're talking to employers, too, who are wanting to get... Um, uh, work, you know, people who, who've got particular skills in open web development. So this whole curriculum that's going to be built over the next 18 months will be 12 to 15 courses, and it's being kind of done in, cons in consultation with the stakeholders, which is the employers. And it's with though most people who work in open web design, for instance, are self-taught, informally self-taught. So um, this is kind of an interesting thing that you're, you're going to see 12 to 15 courses being developed just in consultation with stakeholders. I think it's interesting to think of what a revolution would actually look like. I'm not sure that the open educational resource you know, model would be, in my view, what a revolution would be. You know, who did the textbook? It's not that important in many ways. Um, the way, the second point is on the transdisciplinary aspect and the fact that we can learn different things differently. Um, I'm not sure we need technology for that. We have a lot of very interesting models of universities which are organized around you know, disciplines, projects, where you don't have faculty, where you don't have a tenure, where you don't have research, where they don't need technology to do that. Uh, you have you know, the storytelling uh, curricula. You have a lot of new, interesting ways. Maybe what is the limitation to that is the actual hierarchy of powers. You know, is that it's very difficult. For example, one is all in college in Massachusetts. You know, it's an engineering college organized entirely around projects with no, you know, um, faculties so that, and they redo the curriculum every four years, five years. And, but I just can't see them becoming um, high prestige, uh, institution. Why? Because they don't research and um, because in higher education the quality of teaching is not that important to unfortunately. So if one, I believe that one of the things that is hindering the development of these radical new ways of teaching and learning is just the fact that people cannot care less about the teaching and learning in higher education. Uh, or it's not exactly true, in fact, but the hierarchy of power is very much driven on research, and, and research is still based on um, disciplinary journals, you know, how many citations you get into that, etc. So, I, I was about to comment, and I think that's going to more or less finish up uh, very close the, the session, um, that we shouldn't forget that, again, the the relationship between research and teaching is a recent one in the history of universities. Recent, if you think in terms of the whole history of universities, which has generally been described as being about a thousand years old in the, in the Western tradition. Um, the, the question we could raise ourselves is if with the intervention, massive and rapid intervention of new technological tools, are we not facing the possibility of universities resplitting the educational 
the platform for learning, which is the title of this session, uh, resplitting the the uh, the teaching functions of the university from the research functions. Uh, are we not facing, for example, for cost cutting purposes, the use of technologies to create uh, massive uh, distance education and enterprises where there will be just the dissemination of certified skills but very little interest for uh, the research. And that it would bring the universities exactly where they used to be up to the early 19th century uh, when they were just disseminating the great professions, theology, medicine, and law. And that was, that's what you did in universities. Um, meanwhile, those who were interested in research created new sites for themselves, academies and these kinds of places. Are we seeing the, the, the rise of this sort of thing? Are we seeing a two-tier society where research is being the elite part where the competitive and the prestige and the power comes and the rest is really the dissemination of skills uh, to, the, to a large proportion of the population that is needed to make the economic machine work around. This is... Uh, I, I know it's not a very rosy scenario I'm painting right now, but again, you know, just in the spirit that if we want to shape our future, we should not just be satisfied by being carried by something like, well, with technological progress, progress period appears. Uh, no, with, techno with technology, we decide more or less consciously, more or less lucidly to do things. And at this juncture in the history of the universities, we're at a point where we'd better grasp that nothing is played out. We have to decide and we have to essentially define a, a, some sort of a horizon for ourselves where perhaps research and teaching should remain together and perhaps roles within that should have to be re-examined and re-negotiated uh, in a, an optimal use of these new tools but putting them at the service of the human beings and not the other way around. You know, that would be my, my ultimate statement. I mean, I think Marco wants to give us our conclusion. So. Yes. Um, actually, now we are talking about how to change university. Is split, the, split it, uh, use technology to improve, etc. Uh, I think uh, that's maybe wrong because we should forget uh, everything and start from scratch. Um, a little example. Um, actually, I am been thinking for um, ten minutes about the Aquario uh, game uh, and the way of learning. And uh, if I could, uh, I would uh, um, stop everything. And I would. I, I want to do it now. I want to try it. And uh, of course, I wasn't able to do that. But. Uh, with technology, yes, that is an, instru an instrument, but, but, which is also the value that transforms an instrument in the platform. I will be able to do it, not to stop the time, I mean, but to stop the perception of, of, of time. It's not sci-fi. Uh, I, I, I don't do research about brains, but I know that uh, there are interesting news about that. And uh, since this is not dangerous, about anyone, I mean, that I stop everything and I play and then I come back, it will be possible and uh, the students will do that. We should uh, forget everything. We, sh we, we talked before about teaching, but teaching is the platform. The whole vision is student, uh, teacher and platform. Now, the, the teacher is the platform because my teacher maybe we, it will be the, uh, the HAL 9000 of 2001 uh, Space Odyssey. I don't know, maybe. What's the difference between a, a, a person who spoke to me and uh, a text who is read by a computer? There is no difference because the text, the text has been written by the same, per the same person, I mean. So I think we should really forget everything and start just from needs and, and, per, and people, of course. Then, yes, we can discuss about needs because we have different uh, ideas about needs. And I have my ideas which are, as I said before, ubiquity, you can follow the lesson wherever you are, peer-to-peer uh, -peer feeling, free entrance for students, and being independent. This, yes, it, we can discuss about that. Uh, maybe they are wrong, but forget everything and just start from needs. Because uh, saying that technology is just an instrument uh, is just... Uh, is also a way to to protect the status quo and uh, uh, what everything is now. 
Thank you. Thank you. Well, with these words and with this remark, perhaps, that I, I shall add finally, if technology excites people, particularly young people, I find that wonderful. So go for it and keep on hacking, so to speak. Keep, keep on hacking the institution. But also, let's also sit back a bit and let's see where we want to go, uh, what kind of society we want to define for ourselves, and what kind, what kind of research and learning platform we want to develop for the roles that we want to see learned people play in our societies. Experts, elites, or good citizens? These, I think, uh, are questions we should keep in mind. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. We have a half an hour coffee break, and we'll start uh, at 4 Thank you very much. with Joe Ito's intervention. Thank you. Wonderful moderator. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.